So as human beings, we're always thinking about uh, the future. That's just the way we are. Um, so I wonder, when you think about the future, what comes to mind? I don't know, maybe it's, you're thinking about your holidays, you know, the weather's good, you're thinking about going somewhere. Uh, maybe you're thinking about your kids growing up, you know, you want the best for them. Um, maybe you're thinking about your career, how is that going to progress, what job you're going to do, um, how much money you're going to make. Maybe you're thinking about the start of the next football season. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe you're, I don't know what you're thinking, but we, we all think about the future. Um, but one thing I know about your future and one thing I know about my future is it's full of death. And that's, that's why we need to hear this passage this morning. And verse 13, it tells us that uh, this is something that nobody escapes. It's a problem for us all. It's a problem for Christians. It's a problem for people that aren't Christians. And we all struggle to have hope in the face of death. So how do, how do people deal with death? Where do they find hope? <clears throat> well, there's a few different ways. One is by sort of suppressing it. I remember being at my mum's funeral and uh, you know people come over to you and say the usual things, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, anyway, there's a family member came over and they said that and then he then proceeded to say something like, Oh, she's, she's no longer suffering. You know, that's just things people say. Or when, when people say things like, just be strong or just don't think about it. You've got all this anger, you've got all this grief, you've got all this sorrow. And what people are communicating is that you just push those things down. Don't give in to them. No good will come from this grief. Or people say, it's just natural. They deny how horrible a uh, death is. It's a bit like uh, the Lion King, the circle of life. Um, that when you die, you know, your body uh, decomp decomposes and it gives birth to a sort of new life, plants and trees. So people think it's, it's silly to be afraid of death because you no longer exist, you no longer feel, you no longer think, you no longer suffer. And people think that seeing death as natural takes away its fear. Or maybe sort of thirdly, people grab a hold of things they like the sound of. What I mean is, what I mean is they try and console themselves with ideas they've taken from different religions, you know, things they like the sound of. Uh, or it's just ideas that they've come up with. Sort of like the reincarnation, which is a popular one. You know, I don't know, I'm going to come back as a butterfly, or you know, my energy is going to live on in trees or grass. Or they say, you know, they're in a better place, or I would go to heaven because I'm a good person. I haven't done anything too bad. I haven't killed anyone. Or maybe it's sort of from the TV and the, you know the films where you've got people on, cl on clouds playing harps, all that sort of stuff. And does this work? Does that help people deal with death? Well, no, it doesn't. So, if you suppress it, it doesn't work because, you know, uh, losing a loved one is, is really painful. It's one of the most uh, brutal things you'll experience in life. It will hit you hard. It's, gonna be, it's a shock to the system. Life will never be the same again. You know, you've lost part of you. And suppressing your grief is bad. It's not healthy. I remember reading a book about a, a man who had lost his, uh, his mother, his wife and his, his daughter in a car accident. Uh, he was hit by a, a drunk driver. And um, what he said is you can't escape grief. You can try that, you, know, you can try through different, different means, but sooner or later it will find you out. And saying it's natural doesn't work because it's not. The human instinct uh, tells us that death is natural, it's horrific, we rage against it, um, we know it's not the way things are supposed to be. And 
I'm just making up things uh, because that we like the sound of it. It doesn't work because it's groundless. It's not based on anything. It's it's there's no certainty. You're just grasping at straws. It's and to be totally honest, you're just making it up as you go along. Um, and why? I suppose why ultimately are these these ways of dealing with grief wrong? Well. It's because what matters in uh, life most is people. It's the people we love. We're made to be relational beings. You know, we're born in families. We live in communities. We have friends and neighbours. We get married, have children. We're obsessed by social media. You know, uh, a world full of online people. And one preacher said this: All of your life, death will strip you of loved ones and strip loved ones of you. Death isn't natural. We're made to last, not get weaker and weaker. We're built, we weren't built to lose people. We, we love, but to keep them. And none of the previous ways of dealing with death takes us into account. That what matters to us most is love relationships and death severs those relationships. And death is so painful because it cuts us off from the people we love. So if we're going to deal with death, we have to deal with this. But verse 13 shows us what we need in the face of death. Let's just read verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Paul is saying, you will grieve, you should grieve, it's human to grieve, and someone dies. Death is a monster, it's a nightmare, it's not the way it should be, it's wrong. Just look at Jesus in John 13, you know, he cries at the, friend, at, the, at the grave of his friend Lazarus, he's angry because he hates death, it's not natural, it's completely unnatural. And Paul is telling us we should grieve. You know, we, we may grieve for weeks or months or years or a whole life. But we shouldn't let grief consume us. We need to mix hope into our grief. This is hope that it comforts us and it strengthens us. And bit by bit, hope does its work. And at times it may not be easy because we're in so much pain, but it does us good in the long run. This is grief and hope which exist alongside each other, which console us and which strengthen us. So how do we get this hope? <clears throat> well, verse 14 tells us, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. Well, we don't make it up as we go along. It's grounded in reality. There is a resurrection shape hold in history. God has done something in the past, raising Jesus from the dead, and that's changed the world, your world, your future. Our hope, our hope as a Christian is shaped by the past. Because Jesus died and was risen again, those who trust in Jesus will be brought back from the dead. This is the solid ground that we stand on. You want certainty, you've got it here. Here is something you can grab a hold with, both hands. The Christian hope isn't based on speculation, but it's lit up with bright colours on the page of history and it spells resurrection. It isn't wishful thinking or furry notions or butterflies or flowers, it's power. Power unseen before, power that brings a cold, dead, lifeless, rotting corpse to life, and power that will bring Christians' bodies throughout the centuries up from the grave. Bodies that have rotted, completely disintegrated, bodies that nobody knows where they are, but God will bring them back to life. That's a promise. That's power. That's hope. That's Jesus. 
And that's what Jesus has done for you. If that doesn't get you excited, then I don't know what does. This is good news. This is great news. <clears throat> you and me, <clears throat> and everyone deserves to die for our sin. We deserve to die for the way we've lived our life. We deserve eternal punishment. We deserve hell. Death was ready to do you in, to put the final nail in the coffin. But Jesus steps in and he smashes it to pieces. Because he was smashed to pieces on the cross. For you, Christian. Jesus came back from death. So you will come back from death. For those who know Jesus, death is no longer darkness but light. Death is no longer Sorry, death is now your entrance into glory. This is hope. 1 preacher put it this way. In Jesus, in Jesus' death, in Jesus' death will make us more beautiful. This is hope for you. Rub that into every experience of grief. You will be dazzling, radiant, wise beings if you die in Christ. And what is this hope? Well, verses 14 and 7 tell us. Again, this hope is about people. It's all about a great meeting of relationships, of love. Those who you'll be related with, those who you've never met before. Jesus will come back in power and authority and everybody will know about it. He said in verse 16. And the first thing we would do is wake those dead bodies up from their sleep. Because for Jesus, death is just like sleep. Notice it's the dead in Christ who will rise first. It's not people who think they're good. It's those who believe in Christ. Christians won't be raised because of our life. It was the way we've lived our life. Our record is shocking. We were raised to life because Jesus lived the life we should have lived. Die the death that you should have died. So you will die and rise. Verse 17 tells us that the second group of Christians, the ones who are alive, will be caught up. And this means the seas are to carry by force. It's a sort of idea of a sudden swooping. It says that the life in Christ will be caught up together with them in the clouds. The them is uh, those who are dead in Christ but have been raised. And this is a reunion with those who have gone before. This is not only a reunion with them, with them who have gone before, but it's also a union, reunion with Christ. And this word, uh, meet in verse 17, is sort of like a technical term where the conquering king, you know, went out to fight the battle. He came back. Before he came into the city, Everyone went out to meet him. And when Jesus returns to uh, the earth, he will renew it. This will be a world where there's no more suffering, no more death, no more illness. This is not a world where we're going to be pigeons or we're going to be butterflies or grass or tree or soil. No, the Christian hope is about bodies, perfect bodies, heavenly bodies in which we can do things we can't even imagine in heaven I'll be able to sing even Susanna will be able to sing I'll be able to dance um, do backflips all sorts of things might be a good look at yeah, probably <laughs> I wasn't expecting that um, We'll be able to love perfectly and be loved perfectly. And at the centre of this world we will be a God of perfect love. He'll be in charge, ruling perfectly with perfect justice and kindness and humility. And we will see again those uh, Christian friends and family members who have died. 
We can hug them, we can hear their voice, we can see their smile. They would be themselves, but perfect in every way. We'll be able to eat, eat the best food. We can eat it with a perfect taste buds and smell. It's a bit like uh, Peter Smith yesterday at his barbecue. <laughs> he was eating his lamb chops when we were on the minibus. <clears throat> uh, there won't be pot noodles in heaven. Probably not. Unless they're really good. So what do we do with this hope? Verse 18 tells us. Verse 18 tells us we are to encourage one another with these words. We are to take these truths and apply them to the details of each other's lives. So we need to know what's going on in each other's lives. And take these truths and rub them into each other's lives. So that we can make each other people who can deal with anything. Who are you going to encourage with these words? Do you know people well enough to encourage them with these words? As we've heard already and probably already aware of, we know people in, here, in church who are experiencing grief right now. And let's encourage them with the hope of the gospel. Yes, allow them to grieve. It's excruciating. The heart is breaking. Let them cry. Listen to them. Let them ask questions. Be with them. But be gentle, be sensitive, and speak wisely at the right time. To help them, to strengthen them, when they're overwhelmed with all these emotions. Uh, when I was studying this passage this week, it really helped me a lot. I wasn't dealing with any crisis, or I wasn't dealing with any grief. But I was just, you know, really busy, lots of stuff to do, every day I seemed crammed full of things, there was pressure and stress of sort of busyness and I'm totally honest I was becoming irritated with you know other people. <laughs> I know lots of, lots of us probably feel like this or have felt like this and when life is really busy you sort of try and make it to the end of the day, try and make it to that time when you can relax. And you just get so caught up in uh, things that uh, that's all you zone in on. You just zone in on your problems and yourself. But these truths have a lot to say you know, when we feel like that, when we're really busy. Because uh, when we get like that, we think this is all there is. We just see problems and more problems. We think this is going to be life forever and we lose sight, we lose sight of our real future. We aren't living to get to the end of the day just so we can relax. No, that's not what life is about. And the reason that this passage helped me um, was because I was so absorbed uh, in greater things. I lost focus on myself. And what we focus on, where we think we're going affects our emotions, it affects how we feel about and treat others. And the Christian hope doesn't make you immune to the troubles of this life. But each day we can rub this hope in. It brings you deep joy in the middle of your troubles. But how exactly? Well, one Bible scholar put it like this. Paul's words are a source of continual strengthening for the believer, not just for the future. They convey the insurance that the power of God will never be defeated. God is supreme. Whether we live or die, we are not beyond his power. Whatever you're going through in the daily struggles of life, this passage shows us that God's power will never be defeated. 
We may be under pressure, we may be overwhelmed, we may think, God can't help me. But no, that's wrong. God's power can never be defeated. When you're bogged down by life's troubles, remember that Jesus died and rose again. So you know that God is supreme. Not your circumstances, not other people, not your emotions, not your thoughts. God is supreme. Nobody or nothing can defeat the power of God. Whatever life throws at you, God is greater. And there is a day coming when there'll be no more pressure, there'll be no more busyness, there'll be no, ir- no more irritation. But a beautiful day is coming when you will be reunited to all the people who love you the most and who you love the most. And the person who loves you the most is Jesus. It's going to be awesome, as the Americans say. And that's where you're going. That's where Christians are going. Take a hold of that. Think about that. Pray about that. Talk about that. Imagine that. Sing about that. Let that set your heart on fire. Some of us may be finding life, uh, because, life hard because of our bodies. We live with lots of pain and um, it may, may only get worse. I asked someone this week, uh, what hope does Jesus give, give you for this life? For the fact that he's coming back. That's what they say. That the struggles of this life are only the struggles of this life. Your life is hard because your body is broken. But because of Jesus' return, it won't last forever. You will get a new body. Bodies that no longer get weaker and weaker, but get stronger and stronger. Some of us are not broken on the outside, but on the inside. We may not be struggling with broken bodies, but broken minds. But because of things that have happened to us, or things that we have done, or maybe we can't even trace the cause. This looks different for everyone, you know, maybe it's depression, or schizophrenia, or anxiety, or trauma, or we just struggle with our own negative thoughts. But the Christian hope is, is not that you will lose all consciousness. But you will be given new minds, minds that think clearly, minds only capable of hopeful, joyful, beautiful thoughts. A mind that only sees reality, that's sure, that's secure, that trusts, that hopes. Rub that into your life when you can't get up. Sorry, rub that into your life, and when you can't, get others to rub that into your life. When you're despairing, when you're sad, when dark thoughts dominate, cling to that hope. For some people, it may be that they've been let down a lot. They have not been loved in the way they should have by their family or friends. But a day will come when all that will fade into nothingness. Because you will know you're loved like you've never been loved before. You will meet the one who you realise has loved you all your life. The one who's never broke any promises. The one who's been by your side through all that has happened. And you will meet other perfect Christians, not like the ones sitting in this room. No offense. <laughs> Christians who will love you as Christ does. And that's what's coming your way. For those who have been wrong in this life and will never get true justice. A day is coming when every right will be wrong. Not only actions, but every thought and every word that was wrong will be given an account of. Every single wrong will be dealt with by Jesus. Speak that to each other when you've been wronged. Are you ready for Christ's return? Will you be one of those who meet him in the air? Where are you putting your hope in the face of death? 
Are you putting it in the sort of speculation in the groundless, airy furry notions? Do you think you die and that's just it? But the Bible says if you think those things that you're wrong, there is an afterlife where you will have bodies, it's in a place. The choice you have is what body you will have, where you will spend it, who you will spend it with. He died so you could have a new body. He died so you could have a new world without suffering and death. He died so you could have the best relationship ever. Are you going to turn that down? You'd be crazy too. Come to Jesus today and acknowledge your sin. That you have not lived the life you should have. That you need a saviour and believe that he died for your sins and rose again. So you can have new resurrection life. Do it before it's too late. The Bible says we don't know the day or time when Jesus will return. It could be tomorrow. It could be today. It could be right now. Don't miss out on what's coming. It's too good. As I said at the start, as Christians, our life are full of death. Just like everyone else's life. We will lose people we love. We ourselves may die before Jesus comes back. We still grieve like the rest of mankind. It still hurts. It still breaks our heart. But we have hope. True, lasting hope. I hope it isn't in denial or wishful thinking or make-believe. No hope is grounded in something that has happened in history, in truth. Or to be more accurate, our hope is grounded in someone, Jesus, who died for us and was raised for us. So if we believe in him, we will, we will be raised from the dead. We will meet him in the air with the Lord's people. And what a day that will be. What a future we have. What a hope that we have in the face of death. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we do thank you for the great hope that we have in the face of death. Many people, Lord, um, don't have this hope. And Lord, we do confess that at times we forget about this hope. We get so caught up in the problems of this life, um, real and difficult and hard as they may be. But we pray, Lord, as we think about our future, you would help us to see that this future of those of who will meet Jesus, of this new world, whether we know a death, mourning, or pain, that uh, you would help us, Lord, um, to encourage one another with these words. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to do that. Um, sensitively, wisely, carefully, gently. But yeah, you help us uh, to remind one another of the great uh, Christian hope in the face of death. And um, Lord, pray Lord that you'd help us to have joy thinking about that coming day when we will see you face to face, when we will see, see friends and family members who are Christians who have died, and where we will uh, see new friends and that great meeting of uh, all those saints and that great meeting of seeing you, Lord, face to face. So we uh, pray you'd help us uh, to fix our eyes on this future. Amen. Absolutely.